Uh, I'm Nick Davis, Master Sommelier. Today is January 30th, and there we go. We're talking about the region of Beaujolais, where Gamay Noir reigns supreme. And throughout, you know, we'll talk about the featured wines as is important, but the, um, the main takeaway from this presentation is about the region itself and covering all the different possible styles that you'll see in Beaujolais. So um, first of all, let's put Beaujolais on the map of France. I, I would actually say that this is the most central wine region in France. I mean, there's a few weird places like Cote Rouennaise that are arguably literally more in the center, but I think Beaujolais, we could say is like a central France appellation or region. It's kind of on the east side, but kind of smack in the middle. And it's not far from the city of Lyon. And Lyon is an awesome city. I've been there and they have uh, all kinds of cool stuff going on. It's a gastronomic epicenter and all kinds of um, great chefs have come from there. Who was it? Was it Paul Bocuse was the famous chef from there? I, I think so. Uh, he passed recently. But anyways, Lyon is great. And it has the um, it has the Beaujolais region above it and the uh, Rhone region below it, so north and south. So it's got wine on either side, and then you just go east a little bit, and you've got Bouget and Jura and Savoie. Um, so great place to be in Lyon. I'd rather li live in Lyon than Paris, uh, for sure. Not to, uh, not to hate on Paris, but Lyon has it going on. And so within the Beaujolais region, the latitude is 46 degrees north. So that's pretty similar to Olympia, Washington, and also Montreal, Quebec, um, to add some context there. And uh, France overall isn't like a huge country. You can drive across it in a day or two. Um, but from, from Paris to Lyon, that'd be a, like a long day's drive. I, I would split it up and go to Burgundy first and maybe Loire Valley. But... Uh, definitely, you could take the train or drive without too much trouble. Just pre be prepared to pay some toll money on the highway. Um, okay, so here we go. Okay, so <laughs> unfortunately, I think Beaujolais is commonly associated with Burgundy. I mean, I'm drinking Beaujolais out of a Burgundy-shaped glass right now, so I'm guilty as charged but it's actually very different than Burgundy in many ways. Uh, the kind of the only similarities are in bold and I think everything else is different. So the grapes of the Beaujolais region include Gamay Noir and Chardonnay. And in Burgundy, we do see um, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Gamay was kicked out a long time ago because it wasn't cool enough. Uh, the price point is quite a bit different between these regions. The very tip top Beaujolais wines even on the unicorn rare level, you're not gonna pay more than $200 for like the rarest awesome Beaujolais versus the rarest Burgundy wines you might pay $2,000 for if they're like Grand Cru super rare producer. Um, so overall, it's kind of like Beaujolais is a country mouse versus um, Burgundy is a city mouse. Um, so, the, uh, the soils of the regions are going to be quite different. Um, Beaujolais is close to the Rhone in terms of soil structure, uh, more of a granite uh, foundation on the soils versus limestone is what we see in um, Burgundy. The topography is also different. We, we know Burgundy is kind of on this uh, famous escarpment of like it's a single slope that goes from north to south within the Cote d'Or especially that all these Premier Cru and Grand Cru are on this one long, big slope. And Beaujolais is totally different. It has all these undulating hills and different angles and aspects. And the topography is just much more diverse in Beaujolais. And that's why they have all these different crew regions that have their own personalities is from the different topography. If we're gonna speak generally, Beaujolais wines are good to drink in kind of the one to five year age range and Burgundy wines, you can extend that longer and there's a lot of aging potential with Burgundy. Now that's not a hard rule. There, there are examples of Van de Garde Beaujolais, which can age for uh, multiple years. And there are even examples uh, on the market right now of wines from the 90s in Beaujolais that are uh, interesting to drink. 
Um, but overall, they do mature faster and don't have as much of that uh, length potential as a general rule. In terms of winemaking, there's a big emphasis on making Beaujolais with the grapes on the rachis. And the rachis is just the stem cluster and the use of carbonic maceration. We can detail that uh, in a little bit. Versus in Burgundy, there are some producers who do whole cluster, but de-stemming fruit is quite common. In Burgundy, it's also very common to use new oak and most Grand Cru wines have anywhere from 30% to 100% new oak usage, which adds a lot of um, both texture and especially aroma to the wines. Uh, that's not common in Beaujolais at all, uh, which helps actually the price stay low because wood barrels are very expensive. It's about $1,000 for a, uh, like a Francois Frere Terenceau uh, new French oak barrel. Um, so by not doing that and using either um, second fill or, or a multi, use barrels that are neutral or using things like concrete or enamel line tanks or stainless steel tanks um, that preserves the freshness and fruitiness of Beaujolais and doesn't impart those um, spice notes that we get from oak. Now, overall in Burgundy, the uh, we can get into the natural wine movement here in a second. Um, but the styles are more conservative and streamlined using conventional winemaking overall versus in Beaujolais, there's a lot more of the natural wine movement thing going on. Uh, we'll get into that in more detail in a second here. What is connecting here, and I think is more important than the wine style, is the viticulture, where in both Burgundy and Bo Beaujolais, there is a lot of emphasis on organic biodynamic viticulture and really just caring about the land. Uh, sustainability is another concept as well. So uh, that is an emphasis that both share, which I think is important. In terms of the actual vineyards, the vines are grown and, and pruned differently. Beaujolais uses more gobelet and Burgundy uses more guillot, as you'll see in a moment. And I think Beaujolais is a bit easier to learn about if uh, someone is a student of wine and, and studying the theory of these regions. The Crews and overall styles of Beaujolais are pretty easy to grasp, you know, here we, in an hour long presentation versus in Burgundy, it might take like 10 hour long presentations to uh, get through that first layer of information. <laughs> so, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do Burgundy another time. Um, Beaujolais should be a bit more straightforward, thankfully. And so let's talk about Gamay tasting notes and you can sip on this uh, Raison Galois while you are um, reading these notes and see if they apply. So the color density is often low compared in the opposite way of like Malbec, which is a very dense color. The hue of the wine, so the actual kind of tone of the color is more on the purple side this looks actually pretty ruby uh, as an example, but um, compared to Pinot Noir, which is quite red, there's more purple tones in Gamay. And many of these wines will be unfiltered and hazy. Uh, this Raison Galois is like pretty clean. You can see all the way through it. There's not a lot of gunk floating around, but I guarantee you if we're, we're drinking like Yvonne Metras, um, I know Jory who's on the call likes Metras, uh, that, that kind of looks like, um, minestrone soup. It's, it can be pretty, uh, pretty gnarly, but um, delicious at the same time. Going through the aro aromatic profile here, a lot of red fruits, bright violet florals, um, green elements, kind of like a cut plant material or uh, like cut stems. The really natty natural wine styles can be pretty funky, smell like a petting zoo, um, kind of like a donkey's armpit type of thing. So those can be gnarly, um, but most Beaujolais wines aren't like that. There's there's just sort of a subset of super natty people who um, who push it. Um, most have a earthy aroma, more in the inorganic earth profile. So like a, if you pound some granite rocks together, that smell might be what Beaujolais is like. And no, the vines aren't like sucking up the granite from the from the dirt, but I think that there is some sort of association going on. Uh, and most of these do not have 
use of oak, so we're not getting the spice aromas. On the palate, most Beaujolais wines are tart, are light in alcohol. Now, 20, 2018 might be a somewhat exception to that rule. I mean, the, the Breton here only says 13%, but I've seen plenty of 2018s that are pushing 15% alcohol because it was a, a warmer year. Um, so the alcohol in most, in most times is, is on that lighter side, you know, 12.5 to 13.5. And then the tannins are typically low in Beaujolais. There are exceptions in some crew, like um, plenty of Moulin Avant and Chainos wines can have like pretty structured tannins. Same thing with Brewery and Cote de Brewery crew. Uh, but usually it's a low tannin, soft wine, which is nice. And the, the texture of the tannin is usually quite angular. So it's kind of pokey, pointy tannins. Versus Pinot Noir are these more silky, soft, uh, velvety tannins. Gamay tannins are pointy and sharp, more, more towards a, like a cat's tongue or shark skin, as opposed to velveteen or like nubuck leather, something like that with Pinot Noir. A couple more concepts on, on tasting these wines. There's this idea of glue glue, which is uh, the way the bottle sounds when you glue, 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 dump it out because uh, you're drinking it so fast. You're not dumping it down the drain, you're dumping it down your gullet. But um, this whole idea of glue, glue wines are these light, fresh, easy drinking wines that are delicious and we want to drink all night long and, and they're um, easy, easily palatable. So kind of Beaujolais is, is what planted the seed for glue, glue, which we see now in a lot of, um, you know, hip sommelier um, social media posts. You'll see that term glue, glue. I do like it with a bit of chill. I think it uh, is refreshing that way. And we wouldn't ever want to chill like a Napa Cabernet Sauvignon or an Argentine Malbec that has a lot of structure because those high tannins are emphasized as, as the temperature goes down. So if you, if you chill Napa Cab, you know, it can be okay, but the, it's just going to clash with the, the structure of the wine versus something like this or Freja or Frappato, great with a chill. And super refreshing if it's, you know, we think about summertime in a few months uh, when we're all out on the patio. Um, it's going to be great with a bit of chill. Some other favorite grapes that sommelier, sommeliers love. Uh, of course, Gamay is uh, at the top of the list on white wines. Riesling and Chardonnay are hugely popular. And uh, I'll put Nebbiolo in there as well. So if you're looking for a, a sommelier uh, direction in, in your wine life, um, start with those four. Now this whole idea about natural wine, it's, it's become more and more popular the last 10 years or so, but it really had its roots in France. Um, you know, we're looking at some of these regions like Loire Valley and Jura, um, Beaujolais is, is in there too of where this whole natural wine thing came from. Uh, if we look at the new world, Columbia Gorge and Adelaide Hills, in Australia, have a lot of natty wine producers. Elsewhere in the old world, Sicily and Galicia in Northwest Spain have a, a lot of this natural wine focus. So it's kind of a trend and you can always identify a natural wine. You know, it's easy to look at the label and if it has like this illustrated label, that's like pretty non-conventional in terms of fine wine. That's a hint. The whole thing with like a wax capsule that's another, uh, that's another hint. So if the top has been dipped in wax instead of uh, a foil capsule, that's, that's a way to spot a natural wine. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a whole um, kind of stylistic paradigm of how the wines taste. And if, if they're, okay, I don't want to spend too much time on this uh, particular subject because it's so polarizing, but there are wines that are made in a natural way that don't, sort of market themselves as natural wines. And then there's the ones that are like, oh, I wanna be a cool kid and make natural wine. And they try really hard to market themselves as that. So a lot of these like Adelaide Hills, like, uh, or you look at like Lucy Margot um, in Adelaide Hills or in Columbia Gorge, like a uh, smock shop band. Um, they, they are like planting their flag of I'm in the natural wine movement. Look how natural I am and, and the wines um, within those even producers are, are highly varied from 
super clean and precise and delicious all the way to like, what is going on? Is this even wine anymore? So it's a divisive topic, but Beaujolais has a lot of these natty daddies and it started with what's called the Gang of Four. So a collection of four producers who, who led the, uh, the movement, Marcel Lapierre, which is what we're drinking with the Raison Galois, uh, Guy Breton here with the, uh, the Morgan, also Jean Foyard, Jean-Paul Thévenet, and Yvonne Metras is kind of a, a bonus member of the Gang of Four, Gang of Five. And the whole idea behind natural wine is, okay, let the wine kind of make itself, or we're just not going to mess with it uh, very much. And I think the, the most important part of natural wine is the, is my opinion, is the focus on organic viticulture and not adding a lot of chemicals to the vineyard and promoting a healthy ecosystem. We talk about microclimate as just the area that's right around an individual vine. Mesoclimate is more the area of an entire vineyard. So I think if a whole vineyard is being taken care of in an organic or biodynamic way, that's gonna promote a healthy ecosystem and invite a lot of maybe native plants and animals and even insects and birds um, and other organisms to, to make a home there. And that is good. Um, stylistically with making the wine, that's where there's a deviation into what natural wine is. And I think for some folks, the idea is, okay, we're going to like pick the grapes and then let the wine make itself and we're going to do nothing to it. And that's where I think things go in a, a bad direction. Um, one, one thing that winemakers avoid is any sort of addition to the wine. And in this way, there's this term raw wine, which I think is more accurate than natural wine, raw wine, where there's not a, any kind of addition of sulfur or uh, chapelization with sugar to the fermentation or nutrients for the yeast to eat or any kind of adjustments um, to the wine and avoiding things like fining and filtration, stabilization, new oak usage. So those are a whole bunch of different terms that would take a, a full presentation to discuss. Um, but basically they're, it's, it's a little bit like, um, I think acoustic guitar versus electric guitar with like, um, you know, with a distortion on it. I, you know, and the, the natural wine folks are like, no, 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 acoustic guitar is a way to go. And Jimi Hendrix is sitting over here like, well, come on, where do I fit in? So um, the, the, the bigger conversation I think has to do with industrial wine. And if there's gonna be a supermarket brand that's made with millions of liters a year, they're gonna have to require all these interventions to, to make, uh, make their wine consistent. And, and that's where a lot of problems occur, you know, with like $5 grocery store wine. With most fine wine, you know, a certain amount of intervention I think is okay. So we'll, we'll leave it at that for, uh, for that topic. We can definitely discuss it more uh, later on. If you have any questions or comments during the presentation, um, please either put them in the chat in, um, and, and we can answer them uh, toward the end. We'll have a whole period of Q and A. If you have an opinion you wanna share or a question for me, uh, do not hold back. Uh, a couple risks that occur with natural wines that are made in a lazy way is uh, the wines can oxidize, which means they might smell like rotten fruit or um, super nutty or spoiled. Uh, the wines can have a really sharp character because maybe acetobacter bacteria has taken over and produced a lot of acetic acid in the wine. Uh, maybe a yeast called Britannomyces has taken over and produced a lot of 4-EP, which stands for 4-ethylphenol. If you ever have like a, a peaty scotch whiskey from Isla, that has a lot of phenols in it, which smells kind of like that barnyard uh, iodine, um, you know, pretty, pretty gnarly aromas. Um, so that yeast Britannomyces can produce 4-EP. There can even be secondary fermentation. So if, um, you know, if the wine didn't go through mallow, I'm getting into all these technical things and I'd love to talk more about them, but we only have so much time. Basically, the, you can have a sparkling red wine when you don't, when you don't think you're gonna be getting a sparkling wine and that's no good. And the other thing is, um, is a sense of mouse. And a lot of these natural wines are known for having a mouse smell or like a mouse cage or like a ferret cage. 
and not a great smell. And it's not totally clear what it comes from, but probably a bacteria. And my buddy Kane down in San Francisco, he has a company called Merchants of Thirst, which does a lot of um, natural wine focus. And their, their mascot is the mouse hunter, is this cat, Maddie, the mouse hunter. And the idea is that uh, he wants natural wines that don't have mouse. And I'm into that. Okay. Whew. I'm, I'm covering all this crazy info. So just buckle up and, and we're going to get through it, but it's going to be a power hour because uh, that's, that's how we're, how we're going to party today. So uh, with Beaujolais, earlier when we were talking about Burgundy versus Beaujolais, I mentioned whole cluster versus carbonic maceration. Whole cluster is when the grapes are still attached to the rachis. So this picture here of the skeleton of the grape is the rachis. And imagine all the berries attached to the rachis. That goes into a fermentation bin and boom, the, the, huster, the clusters are whole. The opposite of that is if the clusters go through a destemming machine where it, it kind of rotates them around and pulls the grapes off of the rachis. That's um, definitely re required in um, Bordeaux, like with Cabernet varieties or else um, you have issues with tannin because this stem, it adds a sense of tannin to the wine. And tannin is that astringent bitter uh, sensation we get from, from red wines. So if the rachis is included, it's gonna add a little bit of tannin and also flavor. We see this whole cluster situation as being common with uh, Gamay production in Beaujolais, Syrah in the Rhone, Pinot Noir in Burgundy, Cabernet Franc in the Loire. And then in any New World area that's going to make those grapes, we'll also see the use of whole cluster. So it adds flavor, it adds tannin. Uh, there's super interesting examples where, okay, when, when the grapes get destemmed off of the rachis, it, it's kind of like when you're eating, when you're eating table grapes and you pull them off of the stem, you can see that opening of, of where it was attached. And if you squeeze a little bit, uh, some juice will come out. So that's an opening. Um, if the grapes remain on, on the skeleton without that opening, that means that yeast cannot make contact with the juice. The juice is where the sugar is and yeast want to eat sugar. So if that seal is maintained, then the yeast won't have any way to eat the sugar. So this is carbonic maceration is where it comes into play of you take whole clusters, the yeast can't get in and you just let the whole clusters sit. There will be an initial fermentation that goes on called carbonic maceration, where an enzyme, which is a kind of a chemical uh, magician, it, it will begin a fermentation inside of the grapes without yeast and will produce a small amount of alcohol. And all of these esters, all of these chemicals that have a highly aromatic um, highly aromatic quality. If you ever have a Hefeweizen beer from Germany, that will often have a lot of esters, a lot of these very fruity like banana tones. And the process of carbonic maceration can cause those esters as well. So that's typical with this whole cluster situation. There are certain producers, let's say like Erica Orr here in Washington state, where they make these laborious experimental wines of clipping the individual berries off of off of the bunch, but instead of destemming and creating that opening for yeast, it's using scissors to snip the individual berries off. So they'll go through carbonic without that stem flavor. So um, definitely a, a, a crazy thing to think about snipping, you know, a hundred berries off of a off of a bunch. Uh, it takes all day, but. Um, Kind of two different things going on here as a main takeaway. Whole cluster, the stems are impacting the flavor and carbonic is a secondary possibility with whole cluster where there's this uh, fermentation that has the potential for uh, aromatic development. Okay. Let's take a look at vine training here in Beaujolais. This is an example of gobelet or goblet, kind of looks like a goblet. And this vine training is common in France and in Spain and in Greece and in Portugal. 
many places in the wine world have gobelet. And this is a very old school, traditional um, style of vine training. And even in California, like there's Zinfandel that's gobelet, but the size is, is a lot different in the scale. Um, so whether it's California or let's say Spain, the gobelet can get big, almost like a tree. But in Beaujolais, they're little. They're, they're, like, a, they're like a corgi sized vine. They're small. So they're spaced out and it, it's a lot of manual work because they're not on any kind of trellis. There's no machine that can go through and trim these vines. It all has to be done by hand. So it's very labor intensive. And those gnarly branches are permanent arms on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the vine plant. And the little tips, it's kind of like the little finger at the end of the branches, those are called spurs. And that's where the new growth comes from every year are those spurs. Contrast that with burgundy versus uh, Guyot training. So this is a, another type of head trained vine, but instead of the goblet where the spurs are kind of coming out in random directions, um, these are going to be connected to a trellis wire. So a bit more organized, uh, still difficult to machine, uh, deal with machines, but it is possible. Uh, most, like if we're up in Chablis, they do machine harvesting all day long. So the machine thing is possible with a trellis wire. And uh, this does still, it's pretty common for it to be by hand as well. And they're pretty close to the ground as well. Still kind of corgi sized, um, maybe shih tzu sized vines. So they're small. Versus American ones are like always, you know, Doberman sized or um, Mastiff. The grape itself, Gamay Noir, is cute. It's maybe the size of a, maybe a baseball or a softball. It's not a giant cluster. And I like these Vermorel ampelography illustrations like you see on the right. That dates back to 1910, back when hand-drawn ampelography was the best way to identify what vine you have. These days there's DNA profiling and all this fancy science. Um, but the art that goes into that ampelography is, is quite nice. And if you wanna see this in a book, you can pick up Wine Grapes by Jancis Robinson and company. And all the uh, illustrations are in Wine Grapes. So that's pretty cool. And you can see Gamay on the vine, these little clusters. And um, you know the berry size is actually pretty decent. Um, so that means that there's not as much skin uh, with a lot of juice on the inside. Versus Cabernet Sauvignon, the berries are relatively smaller. So there's a higher ratio of skin to juice. Okay, now work with me on this one here. The region of Beaujolais, I think it looks like an egg. Now the shape is sort of like an egg in a, in a way, but also the interior is a bit like an egg. You have, you have the outside is just Beaujolais AOP. And if we're looking at the, uh, the map, that's that light pink um, outline. And that's kind of like the shell of the egg, okay? For using our imagination here. And then this darker kind of purple magenta is Beaujolais Village. So it's a subset. And then the interior with all the different colors, that's kind of the eggy yolk. And that's where all the flavor is. Now, nothing against basic Beaujolais wines, but the, uh, the most concentrated, interesting wines in the region are typically the, the Beaujolais Cru. So to review here, we have Beaujolais AOP, on the outside. Beaujolais Village is the next. And then Beaujolais Cru, it's a series of 10 Cru. And those are all individual little regions. Now, someone who's in a Beaujolais Cru could in theory declassify their wines to Beaujolais Village or Beaujolais AOP or Van de France. So declassifying is when you are in a fancy area but you declassify uh, and say that you're in a less fancy area. So it's kind of like you live on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, um, but you're maybe talking to someone who you, you don't want to know where you actually you live and you say, oh, I live in LA or I live in Southern California. You kind of declassify 
the, the prestige of your area for various reasons. Um, so again, Beaujolais, Beaujolais Village, Beaujolais Crew, and then within the Beaujolais Crew are named vineyard areas, which are called Ludi. So let's talk about the different styles. Um, just on that base level, Beaujolais, there's a uh, Blanc wine and Beaujolais Blanc is made from Chardonnay. And these wines taste a lot like the uh, wines of Burgundy in the Macon, in that Southern stretch of Burgundy. And they are, um, they are delicious, but a lighter style. And actually the appellation of saint Varenne and saint Amour, they have a bit of crossover geographically. Mm. See what I tell you, tasty, glue glue, this wine is good. Okay, next is Beaujolais Rosé. So we're still in um, Beaujolais. You might see AOC or AOP on a label. That's uh, Appellation Contrôlé or Protégé. That just means it's a place on a map with rules on how you're supposed to make the wine. So the Rosé is made from uh, mostly Gamay Noir and you can put some other stuff in there too. And um, there's a, a fun link actually on this uh, presentation, which I'll email out to everybody later on the awkward cousins of Gamay Noir. So like Gamay de Bouze and Gamay de Chaudenay, they're these cousins of Gamay that um, aren't, aren't quite as cool, but are interesting. Oh, I didn't mention the producer. So on the previous one, this is Jean-Marc Burgode, who's based in Morgan. And then this is Jean-Paul Brun. And you can see where they're located here, Charnay on Beaujolais, pay them a visit. And then the next is basic um, Beaujolais Rouge. So this is just the basic appellation. It's that shell of the egg. It's on the outside and um, it's any, anywhere within the shell is considered Beaujolais. So that's kind of like, <laughs> I'm obsessed with this egg analogy. E everything inside of the egg is considered the egg, including the shell. So that's basic Beaujolais Rouge by Domaine de Peuble. And here's the next interior is Beaujolais Village. And this is intended to elevate uh, certain villages in the Beaujolais region that are more towards that Northern side of things. And they're, they're good quality wines, typically like not super concentrated or fancy or crazy, but uh, Louis Jadot Beaujolais Village is going to be found at most grocery stores in the country. I, I know it's down at Safeway right now. Um, so I've had it before and it's lovely and easygoing, great when, uh, you know, grilling shrimps on the barbie. So um, also good price point under $20 for sure. Now we're getting into one that many of you have heard of before, Beaujolais Nouveau. This is a bit of a gimmick uh, to promote the region perhaps, uh, but that's okay. And this is a Beaujolais that is released right away. So like in 2021, they will probably harvest those grapes in September and ferment the wine and it'll be on grocery store shelves in Seattle in November. And there's a, a Beaujolais day, which is the third Thursday of November. And that is to celebrate the release of Beaujolais Nouveau. In, and you'll see this Nouveau concept in other countries. Uh, Germany has Neuwein, Italy has Novello. So these, these freshly released wines are popular. I have not seen very many New World examples of Nouveau. So if anybody has a good New World Nouveau recommendation, put it in the chat. I'd like to see what it is. Um, these wines are, are like pop almost. They're very basic and maybe $10 at the store, if that. And George Dubuff is a very large producer who is known for Beaujolais Nouveau production. And here we go with the Van de France. This is what uh, some of y'all are drinking tonight is the Raison Galois. Um, some producers who make this Van de France thing uh, include Marcel Lapier, Johan Lardy, and Anne-Sophie Dubois. And the whole point of Van de France is that the producer doesn't have to make wine under the auspices of the Appalachian rule. So they can basically make wine any way they want. And 
if we think about New World wine, like any wine made in the United States is basically like Van de France. Uh, in Columbia Valley, it's, it's a place on the map. So there's an outline of, of where the region is of Columbia Valley, but any type of wine can be made there. Um, so, so that's kind of how Van de France works is it's anywhere within France and that's the geographic boundary It's pretty loose and it's any kind of wine without rules. The reason in this case for the Raison Galois is that it's young vines and they, um, they let the yields get higher than they would um, for the Morgon appellation. So it, it breaks the yield rule, but it results in pretty delicious, uh, easygoing wine. So these are often uh, found around France. And if you ever encounter a Van de France wine and you wanna know where it's from, you'll see the zip code of the of where the winery is based at the bottom of the label. Oops. And so you have 69267 here. And it turns out that that's in Morgon, um, Beaujolais. So that's a good way of kind of breaking the mystery of a, a Van de France that you don't know where it's from. Uh, there's a lot of Van de France on the market now, especially with this natural wine movement of folks who are breaking Appalachian rules and um, not wanting to uh, follow any guidelines. So that is what you will often encounter with a lot of these hip new wines. Uh, there is also Van de France that's not trying to be hip. It's just trying to be cheap and you'll just have basic, you know, table wine, red wine. And that was the original intention of Van de France is just to have a economic option for making basic wine. But now it's turned into sort of a statement, kind of like in Tuscany, Toscana IGT, it is where a lot of these super Tuscan producers will um, break the rules and make wine their own way and not be in Brunello di Montalcino or Chianti Classico. And this is a plug for our next, uh, our next virtual, virtual event. It's gonna be in February. I haven't picked the date yet, uh, pro probably late February. And we're gonna talk about Tuscany in Italy. If you're excited about that, put your hands in the air. So uh, that is something to look forward to. Okay. Now we'll get into the real meat, the egg yolk, if you will, of Beaujolais, which are the crew regions. There's 10 in total. And when I was studying from the Master Sommelier exam, I always had a hard time memorizing these crew of Beaujolais. And there's all kinds of mnemonics of how to remember it based on the first letter of each name. So like S, J, C. Um, so like C, I think it's like C, Jesus Christ, um, make fun cookies. I, I don't know. I forget what it is. My memory trick is a bit more visual. It's more of a visual mnemonic. So I will group the different crew. There's 10 total into clusters of three, three, and two, and two. So in the first cluster, we have Santa Amor, Juliana, and Shana. And I think of a heart and a jewel and a cherry. So it's kind of like a heart that also looks like a jewel and a cherry. And the heart is Amor and the jewel is Julianos and the cherry is Shainos. So that's a little visual thing that you can plug in. The next three are Moulin Avant, Fleury and Cheroub. Moulin is a windmill and then Fleury, it's like a flower. And Cheroub to me sounds like cherub which are those like little idiots that you put in the garden, like the little garden gnome kind of creepy guys. So <laughs> that's a joke for my mom because uh, we had a family friend who used to call these cherubs little idiots. Anyways, um, that's my little memory trick is a windmill, a flower and a cherub for Moulin Avant, Fleury and Cherub. Uh, the next are Renier and Morgan are two grouped together. And I just think of two dogs that are awesome named Reggie and Morgan who hang out. I don't know, that's my image. And the last are Brewy and Cote de Brewy. It's a couple of bros up on the hill. So um, there you have it. So we'll go through each of the crew briefly. I won't get into too much detail here for the interest of time, but uh, I will showcase one awesome producer of, of each crew, and that will be a, uh, a nice reference point for you. And I will email out the presentation. Um, so don't worry about memorizing all this right now. 
uh, but Santa Mora is the farthest north crew, and it is uh, right next to the Macon uh, region of France, specifically Saint Veron. And word has it, my buddy Dustin in Chicago, um, I was asking some friends what they think is cool about Beaujolais, and they said that Dustin said that a lot of Saint Amour is sold in France domestically uh, for Valentine's Day because it's Amour, you know, like love. It's like the love wine. So. That's a cute story. This is a great example on the screen here of uh, Famille du Treve, and they make a great Saint Amour. Next up is Juliana. Juliana is a neighbor to Saint Amour, and you can actually drive through all the crews of Beaujolais in a day. I've actually done that, and I, if you start from north to south, you just kind of wind through these super circuitous roads and a lot of them are countryside roads and uh, you'll find Juliana after um, after Santa Moore and this is a midweight style crew um, it's it's pretty accessible easy going and Domaine Chapelle makes a lovely Juliana next is Shana which has more density compared to Juliana and this one Pon Paul Henri Filardon makes a kind of Ludi Chena called Chassignol, and it is tasty and delicious. A wax capsule, so you know it's uh, so you know it's natty, but not too natty. Next is Moulin Avant. This is a pretty easy crew to remember because it has a windmill and it has a literal windmill in the town. Um, so this producer here, Yvon Metra is super known for Fleury, which is a neighboring crew to Moulin Avant, but does have some vines here. And if anybody has Metra and they wanna share and drink some with me, uh, raise your hand and I will fly to you and we will drink Metra because it is very rare and very delicious, but often very intense and crazy at the same time. So something to look for. If you see Yvon Metra at your local wine shop, get it, but buckle up. Okay, and right next door, Fleury. Fleury is a very famous crew. I would say it's second in line after Morgon. And this producer here, uh, Jean Foyard, is, is the bee's knees. And I think they are great, but it's expensive now. This Fleury would probably retail for at least 60 bucks. So it's not cheap. It's getting into Burgundy territory as far as price. So watch out for that, but uh, it is good. And as the name suggests, the floral notes are real. Cherub is the highest elevation crew. So this is definitely up on a hill and the, vi the vines are pretty steep on these hills. So it's not easy at all to, um, to harvest them and, and work those vineyards, but they are quite delicate and uh, feminine if, uh, if that's a way we can describe them. And here's a producer, Georges Descombe, who's based in Morgon, but does make a lovely cherub. And here we go, Morgon. And that is another one of the featured wines that we're rocking with here. And I'm gonna pour myself some of this and I'm not going to splash decant this one. I don't think it needs it, but um, this is old vine, 80 year old vines here on the Morgon by Guy Breton. And um, if, if you have this wine in front of you, I think it has, <clears throat> okay. Let's think about this like, um, okay, I love analogies. So if you ever do work with like Microsoft Paint or like, a, like a, any kind of photo editing software, illustration software, you can choose like the basic, there's like red, green, you know, blue, indigo, violet, like the basic color spectrum. That's kind of like, that's kind of like this. It's just kind of one color spectrum. And then you can pop out the rainbow and choose all these kind of infinite uh, variations of purple, let's say. That's kind of like what we have going on with the Morgan. It's sort of the same color spectrum, but there's like 18 tones of color happening all at once here. And it is, uh, 
it's just has these different layers and, and high level of complexity. I think the wine is on the same quality. At, they're both on the same high quality, but one just has more of a complex vocabulary. I'm trying to say the same thing, just with more, more complicated words. So um, it's delicious and I like it. The, uh, the actual crew of Morgan, I think is the most famous in all the Beaujolais crew. All the top producers, many top producers are from there. Um, and that gang of four we mentioned earlier, they all make a, a Morgan wine. And if someone was wanting to study a Beaujolais crew and get down to the level of Ludi, um, the area of Morgan is the one to do it in. Um, I would say Cotepi and Corselet are the two to learn first. Uh, this wine here is made from crew uh, Grand Croix and Saint Joseph. But Morgan is a, um, an area that makes very high quality wines and perhaps the best gamay in France. So this is Guy Breton. Next is a neighbor to uh, Breton, just, just south of it, is Renier. And Renier is not a region that makes a lot of wine because it is quite small. But uh, this example here, Grand et Granit by Charlie Favenet is a lovely one. Um, you'll notice an importer of a lot of these wines is Kermit Lynch. And Kermit Lynch has championed the Beaujolais region for a number of years. Uh, also like Corsica is another region that Kermit Lynch has spent a lot of time in, in working with. Um, but um, Beaujolais, a lot of the top Beaujolais wines are, are imported by Kermit Lynch. I don't know who imports Maitras. If you know, um, let's talk. But in Renier, pink granite is found there. So I think that's cute of uh, thinking about pink granite. We also see another pink soil up in Alsace, uh, which is called Grey de Vosges. So these pink soils are, uh, are cool. Um, and to that point, the name of this Renier wine is Grand et Granit. Okay, now we're in the farthest south crew of Beaujolais and also the largest um, with the most amount of plantings. It covers that, you know, 20% of the crew Beaujolais plantings is Bruy. And so we're in the far south of the crew area. And on that kind of natty spectrum is Michel Gounier make it, makes this nice brewy. And like a bullseye in the center of brewy is Cote de Brewy, and that's this hill. And there are vines planted on all sides of the hill, which is pretty unique. So even the north and the west side, which is not a typical exposure for vines to be planted because they don't get as much sunlight, they are planted on this hill of brewy. And maybe the most famous producer down there is Chateau Thivin. And it is a really cool landmark and a great photo opportunity. And that is the 10th crew. And that brings us to um, kind of the end of, of the planned discussion, uh, which now transitions us into more of a, um, into more of a question and answer period. So a question from Linda, uh, does the pink granite indicate more iron? And I think that's a fair assumption. You know, we think of soils that have a lot of iron as being like Terra Rosa in, in Australia would have a lot of iron oxide. It maybe, but honestly, I think that the pink granite, because granite is like, a, it's a, I guess they used to call it a primary rock. It's a uh, igneous rock. I think it's just like when the granite comes out of the volcano, it is pink. And then, um, or maybe it has things like mica in it that get a pink color. I don't totally know, but I like that question. Um, any other thoughts or ideas here? Um, now I think, I think what would be fun for me to do is, is talk a little bit about blind tasting. Um, when we're uh, talking about Pinot Noir versus Gamay and how to tell them apart. Because I, I enjoy blind tasting and uh, I don't do it as much anymore, but I think it is an imp important um, thing to do to learn about the differences between wines. So visually, um, Gamay is gonna look a bit more purple than Pinot Noir. 
And if you have a hazy wine and you think it's one of the two, it's going to be um, between, it's, it's probably Beaujolais if it's hazy. So that's a nice hint because uh, the chances are if it's hazy, it's unfiltered and they do that more in Beaujolais. So aromatically, the more floral of the two is gonna be Beaujolais, the more kind of savory mushroomy, that's probably Pinot Noir. So if it has like organic earth and it smells like turned soil and mushrooms, that's probably Pinot Noir. If it smells more like flowers and crushed rocks, that's probably Beaujolais. Um, both can be moderate in alcohol, moderate in tannin and high acid. So structurally quite similar, but the texture is different. Um, the, the tannins are more uh, angular and crunchy on, on uh, Gamay and more soft and velvety with Pinot Noir. And then I would say in terms of oak usage, like we said earlier, oak is gonna be found more commonly with Pinot Noir and hardly ever with Gamay. Uh, Gamay also makes great sparkling wine. We see it in Bouget Sardon as an off dry sparkling or even up in Lorraine as um, traditional method sparkling. Uh, Pinot Noir, as we know, makes great sparkling, but in a, uh, you know, more champagne method. So it's typical that like ancestral method is Gamay and traditional method is Pinot Noir. We can do a, a separate presentation sometime about sparkling wine. And a uh, question here about aging on aging on Beaujolais. You know, there, there's a certain classification of Beaujolais wines called Van de Garde, and those are built to age and can, can stand the test of time. So a lot of these higher end Beaujolais wines, um, like, the, uh, like the Foyard Cuvée 3.14 or the uh, Marcel Lapier, it's like a cuvee, it's a special cuvee. Uh, those, those can age you know, five to 10 years for sure. But I think that they show really well in youth. So there's not a huge upside to aging them. I think they can age if you want them to, but the I haven't had that many examples of aged Beaujolais that were better with 10 years of age compared to, um, you know, there's a lot of Burgundy that are pretty shut down in youth. Most like Nuit Saint-Georges, you don't wanna to touch that for 15 years. Um, so a little bit of a, a different story there. So um, I would say if it's a higher end, more expensive Beaujolais, there's more concentration and density there. Sure, age it, age it for a while and maybe pick up a case and uh, try one every year and have a fun exercise with that. Uh, David, Egan, Seattle local here, um, says, um, from Forbes of all places, pink colored granite is a result of an abundance of potassium feldspar within the granite. You can see small specks of milky semi-transparent quartz, dark brown, black, amphibole, and opaque white feldspar in a granite like the one above. The primary mineral is potassium feldspar. Thank you, David. And that brings us to an hour. Any, uh, hey, any Nick, I got a question for you. Um, since you've been there, it, it, is it similar to Burgundy in that there's a, a flat part by the river and then the mountain part and that's where the crews are and then the, the village wines are down low or is everything there on some sort of elevation? Yeah, so the, the flat part of Beaujolais is gonna be south of the crews. It's gonna be more in the Beaujolais village just Beaujolais AOC area. Anything in the crew is going, like anything in the crew area are basically on a hill. So there's, in Burgundy, it's just kind of this gentle slope and you'll see Grand Cru vineyards mid slope and then Premier Cru vineyards above and below right. and then vill village wines on the flat line. There's, there's no kind of crew classification per se in Beaujolais because everything is basically on a hill, but there are flatlands in Bruy of, of any of the crew. It kind of the flattest area would be Bruy, um, but most everywhere else is, is on some sort of hill. And the, they're not all on Mount Bruy. Mount Bruy, it's just one elevation. There's other elevations where the crews are. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you picture like okay. a donut, 
um, the the mountain or like the Cote de Bruy is that donut hole, but in comparison, the actual region of Bruy is 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 larger, surrounding it with more flat elevations. I see. Thanks. Sure. Okay, a question from David. Do you see any of the non-crew villages starting to gain uh, some notoriety? I mean, I think there's a possibility of that, but I don't really know if they end up getting named on the label. And I, I, don't, I don't have any specific examples. Um, I think there is some argument for, you know, making an official Premier Crew system of some kind in Beaujolais. But if we look at the culture of the region, they're so much less formal than, you know, the Burgundians that I don't think they, they have that intention to maintain a formal system. They're, they're kind of freeform. Um, question about favorite New World Gamay producers. There are definitely are some coming out of Willamette Valley that I think are, are interesting. That seems to be a, a decent region for Gamay Noir. Um, I, I think there's some California as well, but probably my favorite Oregon Gamay is from Fela. Fela is based in Napa Valley, but they do um, have, have projects up in Oregon. So I'd say Fela Gamay is my favorite. I think that there are other producers doing a good job as well, um, but they're the only ones that come to mind right off the bat. Matt says, RR wines in Carlton. I wonder if um, like Lingua Franca messes with Gamay at all. If so, that'd probably be pretty good. Uh, I bet you Irie probably makes a Gamay. They're in McMinnville. And if there were another producer, I'd be a Big Table Farm, um, Bow and Arrow. They're probably pretty good. Um, Oregon, the funny thing about Oregon is that if, if there's a grape that exists, there's someone who has brought a vine clipping back in a suitcase and has planted it in, in Willamette Valley somewhere. Um, I know Chad Stock is a big fan of doing that with uh, obscure Swiss varieties and things. So um, there's definitely plantings of Gamay. But the, the problem is they end up being super expensive because a lot of New World wines just are. And, you know, I think it's a nice novelty to drink uh, New World Gamay, but you can get a better French version for half the price with, with any likelihood. So um, kind of a, a debatable topic there. Uh, another thought about Gamay is that it does exist in other regions of France. There is good Gamay in the Loire Valley and also up north in Lorraine, which is by Alsace. And maybe a bit in Jura, question mark. I think there could be some Gamay in Jura very little in Burgundy. It was kicked out by some Duke, I think, um, like 500 years ago. I forget the exact details of, of what it was, but basically they're like, we shall only have Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Gamay is banished from Burgundy. And so it kind of got the boot. Uh, Philippe the Bold, that's right. Oh, Philippe. So, um, you know, Gamay kind of gets the short end of the stick. Uh, but what's interesting, and not everybody knows this, is that the old ancient grape Pinot Noir got together with the old ancient grape Gouai Blanc, and they had some children, and these children are all siblings, and the children include Chardonnay and Gamay Noir and Auxerrois, and Roma Rantan, and Melon de Bourgogne, and Aligote. So there are all, all these different offspring of the same parents. It just turned out that Chardonnay was sort of the, um, the favorite sibling and the others kind of got kicked to the curb in one way or another, but I'm a big fan of, of the others as well. And it's very interesting. It's just like any family with a lot of siblings everyone will have their own unique personality and uh, you know, specialties. But you think of Chardonnay versus like Melon de Bourgogne of Muscadet and they're, they're, they're quite different. Um, and 
Game is maybe the uh, the child who dropped out of high school, but then went and became, you know, uh, avant garde artist in uh, the Lower East Side or Brooklyn or something, and uh, and ended up being very cool and hip and famous. So <laughs> versus like Chardonnay went to you know Juilliard and is like a very you know, proper formal violin player or something. So whatever, my analogies are, are getting the better of me here. So we'll leave it at that for tonight. Uh, if any of you are ever looking for cool gamay to try and experiment with, please let me know and I'd be happy to get you some and also keep your eye out for our Tuscany class, which will be for the end of February. Okay, thanks everybody, I'll see you.